Hello and good morning, everyone. My name is Leisha and welcome to ND Church 1130 English Worship. Today, we are in the second half of this apologetic series entitled A Rational Faith. Why apologetic? Well, let me remind you that apologetic comes from the Greek word and it means speaking in defense. In our context, this next couple of weeks, we will be going through a series of questions defending the Christian faith. Recap of what we've covered so far. Week one, uh, has suffering disproved God? We heard from Bainsey reminding us suffering isn't always bad. Suffering is necessary as part of understanding God's story. The only one who is familiar with pain. He suffered so that we don't have to. He suffered so we are healed for our pain. So we would know of his great love for us. Week two, is the Bible just made up? Doug took us through how the Bible tells one big story. All part fit into one coherent storyline. Each writer has a role, has a role, all working together for the same ultimate purpose. Bible has Christ in the center, all of God's work in the world. Week three, do we need God to be good? Bainsey helped us look at fundamentals of being good. Kindness to one another doesn't make sense without God. The Christian story assigns the foundation of morality. Today, we will discover yet another interesting question. What about the dinosaurs? We have been using an online platform called Slido, and it was so good to be able to engage with you at home and for our speaker to also answer your burning questions. This week, we will do so again. We'd love for you to post your questions. There is a QR code as well as a link for your questions. It is live now if you want to click on the link. If you're not familiar with Slido, it's a live tool for you to post your questions online. Give it a go. When you do go into it, click on the Q&A tab and type away your questions. You are able to remain anonymous and you can also vote on someone else's question. Our aim for church service is to be interactive so you could do send in your questions so we'll address them at the end of service. I have them live on my screen now and I look forward to seeing your questions. Whether you've been worshipping with us all along or you're just visiting us for the very first time, either way, we'd love to say welcome. For many of us, being in lockdown and on screen day and night can be extremely exhausting. Please create healthy boundaries for yourself and do make a commitment to do some self-care. Another thing that I did this week was to be able to finish 5 p.m. sharp on Friday. And this week, I finished at 4.30. So please do take every opportunity to reach out to someone, perhaps this week, yet another week, to see how they are tracking. Sunday is a glorious day of the week. And I love it because I get to worship our God who is the creator of heaven and earth with you, wherever you may be. The Bible tells us a story of who God is and what he is like. It represents God's dealing with the world and with man. That's why as a church, we read it together. And we encourage one another from the scriptures. Psalm 148 says, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for at his command they were created. And he established them forever and ever. He issued a decree that will never pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth. You great sea creatures and all ocean depths, lightning and hail, snow and clouds, stormy winds that do his bidding. You mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, small creatures and flying birds, kings of the earth and all nations, you princes and all rulers on earth, young women, young men and women, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens, and he has raised up for his people a horn, the praise of all his faithful servants of Israel, the people close to his heart. Praise the Lord. 
If you've just tuned in, welcome. We're about to change and move into our praise and worship. We'll be following the order of service in our e-bulletin. If you'd like a copy, please let us know in the contact us section of this website. Let us start today's service by singing praises to our great God. So I'll hand it over to Dan and Jen. Good morning, my name is Daniel and this is Jen. Um, we've had a lot of time to appreciate and be thankful for our backyard um, during lockdown. So I've been following the trails of ants across the grass with my son and seeing the little um, ecosystems when you lift up a rock. Um, let's begin today by praising the God who created every little detail that we can see. declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after that day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Uh, so when you look at the order and the wonder of the universe, the stars or the ants or dinosaur bones, do you see evidence of God in his character? Or do you see evidence against the existence of God? Um, let's keep singing as we prepare our hearts and minds to hear what God has to tell us today. Sky. 
with a crying toddler at the back as well. So thankful for you guys for serving us, uh, yeah, together. Um, hello, Wensley. Hello. Thank you so much for reading the Bible for us yet again. Uh, we're going into our fourth week of this series right now. What has struck you so far in this series? Yeah. I think it's been, like, really reassuring to know that there are reasons behind certain things and events. That's really cool. Do you, since that we're talking about dinosaurs today, do you have a favorite dinosaur? Yeah, I had to look up like a bunch of dinosaurs before this. And I think I like the Velociraptor. <laughs> cool. <laughs> I'll leave you to that to uh, read the Bible for us. Thank you. Uh, today's Old Testament Bible reading comes from 1 Kings chapter 2. When the time drew near for David to die, he gave a charge to Solomon, his son. I am about to go the way of all the earth, he said. So be strong, act like a man, and observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in obedience to him and keep his decrees and commands, his laws and regulations, as written in the law of Moses. Do this so that you may prosper in all you do and wherever you go, and that the Lord may keep his promise to me. If your descendants watch how they live, and if they walk faithfully before me with all their heart and soul, you will never fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel. 
Now you yourself know what Joab, son of Zeruiah, did to me, what he did to the two commanders of Israel's armies, Abner, son of Ner, and Amasa, son of Jephthah. He killed them, shedding their blood in peacetime as if in battle. And with that blood, he stained the belt around his waist and the sandals on his feet. Deal with him according to your wisdom, but do not let his gray head go down to the grave in peace. But show kindness to the sons of Barzillai of Gilead and let them be among those who eat at your table. They stood by me when I fled from your brother Absalom. And remember, you have with you Shimei, son of Gera, the Benjamite from Barhurim, who called bitter called down bitter curses on me the day I went to Mahanaim. When he came down to meet me at the Jordan, I swore to him by the Lord, I will not put you to death by the sword. But now do not consider him innocent. You are a man of wisdom. You will know what to do with him. Bring his gray head down to the grave in blood. Then David rested with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. He had reigned 40 years over Israel, seven years in Hebron and 33 years in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of his father David, and his rule was firmly established. Now Adonijah, the son of Haggith, went to Bathsheba, Solomon's mother. Bathsheba asked him, do you come peacefully? He answered, yes, peacefully. Then he added, I have something to say to you. You may say it, she replied. As you know, he said, the kingdom was mine, or Israel looked to, the, to me as their king. But things changed, and the kingdom has gone to my brother for it has come to him from the Lord. Now I have one request to make of you. Do not refuse me. You may make it, she said. So he continued, please ask King Solomon, he will not refuse you to give me Abishag, the Shunammite, as my wife. Very well, Bathsheba replied. I will speak to the king for you. When Bathsheba went to, the, went to King Solomon to speak to him for Adonijah, the king stood up to meet her, bowed down to her, and sat down on his throne. He had a friend brought for the king's mother, and she sat down at his right hand. I have one small request to make of you, she said. Do not refuse me. The king replied, make it my mother. I will not refuse you. So she said, let Abishag, the Shunammite, be given in marriage to your brother Adonijah. King Solomon answered his mother, why do you request Abishag, the Shunammite, for Adonijah? You might as well request the kingdom for him. After all, he is my older brother. Yes, for him and for Abiathar, the priest, and Joab, son of Zeruiah. Then King Solomon swore by the Lord, May God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if Adonijah does not pay with his life for his request. And now, as surely as the Lord lives, he who has established me securely on the throne of my father David has founded a dynasty for me, as he promised. Adonijah shall be put to death today. So King Solomon gave orders to Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, and he struck down Adonijah and died. To Abiathar the priest, the king said, go back, to your, your, go back to your fields in Anaphor. You deserve to die, but I will not put you to death now, because you carried the ark of the sovereign lord before my father David and shared all my father's hardships. So Solomon removed Abiathar from the priesthood of the lord, fulfilling the words that the Lord has spoken at Shiloh about the house of Eli. When the news reached Joab, who had conspired with Adonijah, the Lord of Absalom, he fled to the tent of the Lord and took hold of the horns of the altar. King Solomon was told that Joab had fled to the tent of the Lord and was beside the altar. Then Solomon ordered Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, go strike him down. So Benaiah entered the tent of the Lord and said to Joab, the king says, come out. But he answered, no, I will die here. Benaiah reported to the king, this is how Joab answered me. Then the king commanded Benaiah, do as he says, strike him down and bury him. And so clear me and my whole family of the guilt of the innocent blood that Joab shed. The Lord will repay him for the blood he shed, because without my father, David knowing it, he attacked two men and killed him with the sword. Both of them, Abner, son of Ner, commander of Israel's army, and Amasa, son of Jepha, commander of Judah's army were better men and more upright than he. May the guilt of their blood rest on the head of Joab and his descendants forever. But on David and his descendants, his house and his throne, may there be the Lord's peace forever. So Benaiah son of Jehoiada went up and struck down Joab and killed him. And he was buried at his home out of in, in the country. The king put Benaiah son of Jehoiada over the army in Joab's position and replaced Abiathar with Zadok the priest. 
Then the king sent for Shimeon and said to him, Build yourself a house in Jerusalem and live there, but do not go anywhere else. The day you, will, the day you leave and cross the, the Kidron Valley, you can be sure you will die. Your blood will be on our head. Shimei answered the king, What you say is good. Your servant will do as my lord the king has said. And Shimei stayed in Jerusalem for a long time. But three years later, two of Shimei's slaves went up to Achish, son of Makar, king of Gath. And Shimei was told, Your slaves are in Gath. At this, he saddled his donkey and went down to Achish at Gath in search of his slaves. So Shimei went away and brought the slaves back from there. When Solomon was told that Shimei had gone from Jerusalem to Gath he had, and had returned, the king summoned Shimei and said to him, Did I not make you swear by the Lord and warn you? On the day you leave to go anywhere else, you can be sure you will die. At that time you said to me, What you say is good, I will obey. Why then did you not keep your oath to the Lord and obey the command I gave you? The king also said to Shimei, I know in your heart all the wrong you did to my father David. Now the Lord will repay you for your wrongdoing. But King Solomon will be blessed, and David's friend will remain secure before the Lord forever. Then the king gave the order to Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, and he went out and struck Shimei down, and he died. The kingdom was now established in Solomon's hands. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our focal point today uh, is pre-recorded. Aaron, our interviewee, was at our church many moons ago until he started studying full-time at Moore Theological College four years ago. He is currently at Chester Hill Anglican as part of his training. This is him and his wife, Ada, and they have a six-month-old cutie, Samuel. Aaron is super nerdy and didn't even did a doctorate in science. Today, as we talk about dinosaurs, science, and the Bible, here is my interview with him on Friday night. Hey, Aaron, how's it going? Hi, Leish. Uh, good. good. Really good to see you and really good to be a part of this service. Cool, cool. We haven't seen you at ND for a while. Like, where have you been? Yeah, well, uh, I'm still studying at Moore College and I'm about to finish up for the year and we're still also at Chester Hill Anglican where we're meeting in smaller church groups on Sunday. So, yeah, it's still really interactive. We get to catch up with one another, that kind of thing. And it's a bit easier to invite new people. Uh, I've also taken up a ministry position at Sydney Uni this year, uh, working with the Christian group on campus and ministering to postgrad students, academics and university staff. And that's a really great opportunity to share my own experience as a postgrad student in the past. Oh, cool. that's nice. Um, well, as you know, we're starting a new series called uh, A Rational Faith. And um, this week we're going through um, yeah, what about the dinosaurs? So do you have a favorite dinosaur? Yeah, I did as a kid. I really loved dinosaurs and I liked the Stegosaurus. It was just so, you know, a bit different and unique um, and had a really, it somehow worked even though I had a really small brain. <laughs> cool. I'm uh, thinking about the dinosaurs and science, like has, how has science played a part in your life uh, as you were growing up? Hmm. Yeah, I really loved science and figuring out how things worked uh, ever since I was young. So, you know, in high school, uh, my favorite subjects were usually the science subjects. And I went on to study it, uh, science at university and went on to do my doctorate in chemistry. So it can't be too bad if I spent so many years studying it. Yeah, indeed, Dr. Yap, hey? <laughs> Some would say that science has disproved God. What are your thoughts on that, having yeah, done your doctorate on, in science as well? Yeah, it doesn't make sense. That's my short answer. Like science is the study of what happens within the universe, figuring out how it works. And it's figuring out how created stuff works. That is stuff in the universe. But God, well, God is uncreated. He's outside the physical universe. So how can the study of what happens inside the universe prove that there's nothing beyond the universe? Like science can only tell you the how. You can't answer those why questions, which where which is where the Christian faith comes in, I think. Yeah, that's true. Like, how then has science helped you in your conversation with people about Jesus? Yeah, sometimes people wonder 
well, hang on, you know, you're trained as a scientist, but you're a Christian. How does that work? So sometimes it's a good conversation starter and mm -hmm. sometimes it stops people uh, dismissing your faith straight away. So they think, oh, you know, you can't be that irrational. You're a, you're a scientist or you're trained as a scientist. Uh, the other thing that's helpful, I think, is science is concerned with the search for truth, right? Yeah. We want to figure out how things work. And sometimes that's, that's a thing that Christians are concerned about as well. Uh, Jesus himself calls, uh, calls himself the way, the truth, and the life. So I think understanding science can help, uh, help in that search for truth uh, and understand what other people are going through when they do that. Mm, yeah, especially now with um, post-grad ministry that you're doing in right now and into the future, do you think uh, science is a way in into Christian conversations? Yeah, possibly. Um, depends who you're talking to. You know, mm. you want to find out is this person genuinely interested in that topic of science and Christianity? Is it a genuine stumbling block that's you know stopping them becoming a Christian, for example? Or is this person just there to argue with you? Uh, you know, it doesn't matter what you say, then they're not going to change their mind. You want to ask yourself that. Or maybe the question they have is not nothing to do with science. It's maybe the question of, you know, how can a good God allow suffering in this world? Or, you know, why does God say that some lifestyles are wrong? And you're only going to find out what the stumbling block is by finding out what someone believes. And I guess the other thing I want to say is, you know, what's our goal? Our goal is to engage people with what the Bible says about Jesus. Uh, we want to get to Jesus, don't we? So having that interesting conversation about science and Christianity, well, it might be a stepping stone to that goal, but it might not be. Let's not be distracted away from talking to people about Jesus because he's the one we want to get to. Mm, that's really, really helpful. Thanks for that. It's, uh, yeah, we'll see what Doug has to say about science and after this. Cool. Thanks. Thank, thank you so much for your time, Aaron. Really appreciate it. Speak to you soon. Bye. We'll now be spending some time praying together as a congregation. Prayer is a privilege of a Christian's life, and it's how we talk to God. Prayer is a friendship with God. Friendship that is not formal, but it is also not formless. It is a way we admit our need and adopt humility before God. If you'd like to open your e bulletin, you'll also see uh, what we'll be praying for today. So join me as we pray to God. We praise you, God, Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who blessed us with everything we need for life. We pray that we will take our spiritual life seriously and be committed to spending time in solitude. Help us to develop attentiveness to your voice in us, to come to know the spirit that you have already given to us. The pains and struggles that we encounter in our solitude then becomes a way of hope because our hope is not based on something that will happen after suffering is over, but on the real presence of God's healing spirit in the midst of these sufferings. Help us to taste the beginnings of the joy and peace which belong to the new heaven and new earth. Lord, thank you for the book of Job. We pray that in our afflictions, that our reflections on creation would lead us to stand in awe of you. We pray for the people of Afghanistan in, this, in the current distress and pray for the evacuation efforts. We pray for those who are vulnerable, abused and face oppression. Lord, won't you give them the comfort of the families fleeing for their lives and provide a safe home. We pray for God to bring your miraculous peace and stability among the Afghanistans through its leaders. We pray for the protection of a Christian church who face persecution and death under the Taliban. We pray for strength to follow Jesus no matter what the cost. We pray for our state government as they work tirelessly for us to come out of lockdown. We pray for Lord that you would give those in authority wisdom, insight, patience and kindness to the people making decisions that would affect us all. We also want to remember families who have lost loved ones due to COVID. We pray for those in hospital in critical condition, those who have lost their jobs, Lord, we pray that we will display Christ's love to reach out as a community, showing grace and love in those, especially during these tough times. We pray that we'll be thankful for the many things that you have already provided for us. 
We pray for the Rational Faith series that we might be rooted in what we believe and that we are strengthened with power through your spirit so Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. Lord, we pray for our partners in the Ministry of Reconciliation abroad and locally. We want to pray for continued perseverance and boldness. We pray that you would use people's hardship and uncertainties to draw them to you. We pray this time particularly for Karen and Jade in Auburn. We pray for the Muslims that they administer to, that, Lord, you would reveal yourself, whether it's through dreams or visions. Lord, we pray that you will speak to them directly. We pray uh, for Karen and Jade as well to be able to use this time well during this lockdown in Sydney. Finally, Lord, we pray for the sermon that we're about to hear. We pray for Doug, that he would be able to speak faithfully from your word. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. How good it is to be able to read God's word again. Wesley will continue to read for us today's sermon text on Job, and then Doug will help explain the word to us. Today's sermon passage comes from Job chapter 40, verse 15 to chapter 41, verse 11. Look at behemoth, which I made along with you, and which feeds on grass like an ox. What strength it has in its loins, what power in its muscles of its belly. Its tail sways like a cedar. The sinews of its thighs are, gl- are close-knit. Its bones are chews of bronze, its limbs like rods of iron. It ranks first among the works of God, yet its maker can approach it with his sword. The hills bring its produce, and all the wild animals play nearby. Under the lotus plants it lies, hidden among the reeds in the marsh. The lotuses conceal it in its shadow. The poplars by the streams surround it. A raging river does not alarm it. It is secure, though the Jordan should surge against its mouth. Can anyone capture it by the eyes or trap it and pierce its nose? Can you pull in a leviathan with a fish hook or tie down its tongue with a rope? Can you put a cord through its nose or pierce its jaw with a hook? Will it keep begging, begging you for mercy? Will, will it speak to you with gentle words? Will it make an agreement with you for you to take as your slave for life? Can you make a parrot of it like a bird or put it on a leash for a young woman in the house? Will traders barter for it? Will they divide it up among the merchants? Can you fill its hide with harpoons or its head with fishing spears? If you lay a hand on it, you will remember the struggle and never do it again. Any hope of subduing it is, it is false. The mere sight of it is overpowering. No one is fierce enough to rouse it. Who then is able to stand against me? Who has, who has a claim against me that I must pay? Everything under heaven belongs to me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hi, Doug. How's it going? Great, Leish. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for preparing today's sermon for us. That's all right. Without giving too much away, what is one thing you'd like us to keep thinking throughout today's sermon? Uh, That's a really good question. And I have been thinking about it. I I mean, it's really similar to what I said a couple of weeks ago. It's just trying to read the Bible as, as you said earlier, as one story and trying to ask what is... How, how do the parts help me understand the whole? And also, how do the, how's the whole help me understand the parts? Um, I think that's probably the, the main thing. And I, I think trying to think about this topic of, of dinosaurs and, and science, it's, again, thinking about uh, how, how do I think about this, I guess, modern, you know, even though it's an ancient thing, and this modern question help me, uh, how, how does thinking about the bigger picture help me to understand how to answer that question or what to maybe even what's a better question to ask than what about the dinosaurs yeah cool thanks for that we'll keep thinking about how it all fits into one mega story yeah. um remember for those uh online as well to uh, have the qr code or the link to be able to ask to prepare your questions send them in and then we'll answer them at the end thank you thanks doug cool all right well uh hi everyone uh we're, we're thinking about dinosaurs today um and i guess um it's uh maybe the first thing to to ask is when you open your bible so if you've got a bible there and you, you open it up to the first page and you flick past the publishing information and the contents and you get to genesis chapter 1 verse 1 what what do you imagine is going on there in your bible you know what what do you what do you think is being said what is 
what what picture do you form in your mind of what's being described? Um, do you do you think of uh, modern modern people like you, you or I, and this is sort of describing what you might see if you were there watching creation? You had a video camera, or you were journaling what you saw that day, or do you think of something like the Flintstones, or uh, you know what, what's what's in your mind? So who do you think this is written to? Uh, who do you think is written by? Th those sort of questions. Uh, so that that's what I, I I guess the first thing to think about is what do you think is going on here? What do you expect? Now, some people, uh, and perhaps many people, open the first page of the Bible, and when they open it, they see exactly what they expect. So if they don't believe in God to start with, then uh, they, of course, they just see more evidence of this sort of primitive worldview of the people who wrote and read the Bible back in the day. Uh, they begin at Genesis 1, they laugh, and they don't need to read any further they, they know what kind of book it is they might read it for historical reasons to understand what people used to think or they might read it because of you know the literature and the poetry and that sort of thing you know the bible's um you know well known for being a, a interesting work of of uh of literature uh, and so they read it that for that in that way other people of course read it differently um and and i'm thinking about christians here of course you know we're armed with the belief that our God raised Jesus from the dead. And so if, if God raised Jesus from the dead, then what can't God do? Uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 9 says, I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. So God can make more people out of stones. So what can't God do? And so therefore you get to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and you start reading, and the Bible seems to say that God made the universe out of nothing in six days. And so who are we to say that he didn't? Now, if someone says that they believe that the world was made in six days, they might also say that it was made in six days, 6,000 6, years ago. Um, this is following a date made by Bishop James Usher, who was an Irish bishop who was around about 400 years ago, and he added up all the years in the Bible, as you might like to do sometime. I remember sitting down uh, a few years ago and just you know, spending a lazy Saturday just adding up all the days and dates and trying to make my own timeline of the Bible. Uh, he added up all the years and, and Bishop Usher uh, thought about the seasons, he thought about some equinoxes and he came up with God beginning his work of creation at six in the evening on the 22nd of October 4004 BC. So everything that is in the world is around 6,000 years old. Now, if that's the case, then of course the question is, where do dinosaurs fit in? Now, this is a, a pretty normal um, description uh, diagram of what happens in Genesis chapter one. And if you have a look there, you can see what happened on different days. So uh, day one, he got separated light from dark. Day two, he separated the water above from the water below. Day three, uh, he made water separated from land and he also created plants. Day, and then sort of day four, five, six, he fills in those other things. So day four, he fills in the, the light and the dark by putting stuff in the sky, planet, stars, um, sun, moon, that sort of thing. Day five, he made all the fish and the birds. And then day six, he made the, the walking uh, creatures along with humans and so, so if you're going to say, where do the dinosaurs fit in? We're well, going to say day five for the, for the swimming dinosaurs um, and the, uh, the swimming dinosaurs and the flying dinosaurs and then day six for all the other ones. Uh, and so the, the way the story goes is there's, because there's no death before the fall, uh, the dinosaurs along with lions and vultures and, and whatever else were all vegetarian. And then, of course, sit into the world and they said, actually, I'm going to get me a bit of meat. And so that's Tyrannosaurus and, and Velociraptors and all those other ones were just friendly until then. Uh, now, what about the Ark? Of course, you might ask. What about the Ark? Well, that was populated with all the animals. Uh, and although um, young earth creationists, as you call, as sort of the title for people who believe that the world was created six days, in six days, six thousand years ago, they, they said you might not need as many animals as we might imagine. So uh, I'm trying to remember back in the day when I read all this stuff, they, I think they said 
for all the snakes in the world today, you might have only needed seven different types of snakes on the ark and they could sort of um, uh, breed from those ones and so on. And so same deal with the dinosaurs. Most dinosaurs were small. So things like the Tyrannosaurus or whatever, there weren't that many of them uh, that they were that big, most were smaller. And then you could just bring the baby ones and the and eggs and that sort of thing. Uh, I saw, I couldn't find it when I was looking for it, uh, but there was this great cartoon of the ark and there's one brontosaurus in the ark and it's like sorry we're full <laughs> we've got one <laughs> one animal in there and there's no more room for anything else uh so and you know and i also apologize to all the animals um so and i guess their point is that wouldn't have happened you could have fitted a little brontosaurus or a brontosaurus egg uh in there um, but the, I guess the argument goes that the post-flood world didn't go so well, so most of the ant dinosaurs died out, uh, but not all of them, and that's why we might think of, that's where things like dragons and stuff came, come from, the idea that there were animals around, and that sort of that cultural memory retains the idea that uh, retains the history of, of dinosaurs and humans hanging out. Now, all of this, I guess, is to say that the Bible is God's word. So the Bible is true about any, because the Bible is God's word, God's word, anything the Bible talks about is also true. And, uh, and so if you have the Bible and something else disagreeing, so whether it's history or science or something else, we need to trust God at his word and rethink our history or our science. And, um, and so you might have lots of examples where, you know, uh, for example, in Luke's gospel, people said, oh, that can't have been the way it happened because of archaeology and, and geography. And they actually found that thing that they, they didn't believe was there. And so the Bible was proven right. And the argument goes that same deal with science. So if science says uh, this isn't the way it happened, the, the world is much older than 6,000 years, then we need to trust God, his word, and eventually science will be proven, uh, the Bible will be proven right as science aligns. Okay, so that, that's the sort of young earth creationist position. Uh, of course, a couple of hundred years later, along come, uh, came Charles Darwin. He upset everything by describing natural selection. And then, of course, other disciplines like cosmology and geology. And, and maintaining a date of 6,000 years was no longer really sustainable in respectable scientific circles. You need to add a lot of zeros yeah, to, add, to get to any date even marginally close to the, um, to the actual supposed date of creation. Uh, if you want to believe the scientific academy, the universe is 14 billion years old. The earth only turned up four and a half billion years ago. And so if you wanted to have that and God's trust God at his word, then there's obviously, you know, a bit of strife, a bit of um, conflict there. Um, but if, and again, the argument goes with young earth creationism that if God's word is true, then where science and the Bible disagree, science needs to bow to God. Some people wanted to have their cake and eat it too, of course. So they came up with this thing, which we call the gap theory. And this hinges on the idea that one day can have a variety of meanings. Uh, so in this case, one day might be an era, era or an eon or an age. So could be a million years or millions or hundreds or even billions of years for some of the days. Um, now, how does this work? Because some things don't really make a lot of sense. The idea is that it's, uh, it's from, it's not what actually happened, it's holding a video camera. So if you're sitting on the earth with a video camera and you're trying to describe creation, uh, you might describe, again, things being dark and light, but not necessarily seeing the sun because there's lots of mist and cloud. So that's why if you look at, again, at your Bible at Genesis, um, Genesis 1 verse 9, that's where the water is gathered and there's water and land and then there's uh, all the plants turn up there. But it's only on the next day. So the photosynthesis had happened, but then the sun doesn't turn up until the next day. The argument is it's because you just couldn't see it. So it was there, uh, but that you can't see the sun and the sky until day four. So essentially this Bible is trying to say, this view is trying to say that the Bible is God's word and we believe God's word, but we also think that science makes sense the way it's describing creation. And so you have to read it in a way that makes it fit. And, uh, and I, I guess my perspective is there's a lot of effort being made to, to 
make Genesis 1 say what modern science also says. So you have to change what a day means. You have to change what created means. So when God says, let there be, it now means let this thing be seen by someone if there was a person, but they're not, they don't exist yet. Uh, let this thing be seen by the earth now. Um, I would say a more plain reading of Genesis 1 is that it describes there's nothing and then God makes something. God brings things into existence. There is no sun, moon, stars, planets until day four because that's when God created them. Um, so I think this sort of the gap theory, the six days in inverted commas, tries a little bit too hard. It's sort of an each way bet, trying to have your cake and eat it too. Um, but I also think there are some, some issues with what is uh, I call, they call um, the literal reading. Because uh, saying when you're faced with facts or the Bible, you have to choose the Bible, even if the facts are staring you in the face. Uh, so there's a group uh, or a few groups out there called Creation Research. Uh, their literature describes biology and geology and cosmology that disagrees with them as anti-Christian evolution promoting heresy which is quite full on, yeah? And, um, and I mean, we, if Aaron was here in person, not on a video, we could have asked him, you know, what were your colleagues like who didn't believe in Jesus? And, and I think he would agree that most people don't become scientists in order to own creationists, in order to look down on them and to laugh at them. Uh, they, they just want to understand the world around us. They want to make sense of the best facts in front of them. They, they want to, they're not trying to start a fight. They're not doing this in order to, um, attack 6,000 year creationism. Um, you know, there are some people who do do it the other way around. They might be creationists, but they might actually get turned to the other side. So there's a, a guy at UWS uh, called Luke Barnes, and he's a, um, he was a six day, 6,000 year creationist. And then he became a cosmologist in order to show how, um, how all modern science is, or all modern cosmology is wrong. He ended up becoming a fairly vocal uh, spokesperson the other way around um, for, you know, a very old universe, uh, but also a Christian. Um, I think, so again, what I think most scientists are doing isn't, then they're not getting to science in order to become, you know, evolution promoting Christianity denying heretics. They're just trying to understand the mysteries of the cosmos. And that's true whether you believe in a creator or you don't. So, uh, I guess there's, a, there's another way of approaching things, which is rather than to say six days or six days, it's six days, so which is, I guess you could say six literary days, which is to say it's the Genesis 1 is telling us a true story about the cosmos, about the God who made it. Um, and so people like, um, there's a guy, an apologist called William Lane Craig, who you might be familiar with. There's another, there's a theologian called Karl Barth and others use this term mythic history. So not that the Bible is telling us a myth, but it's not telling us straight history either. It's telling us history in a, in a, in a mythic way that it has the greatness of myth. Uh, so why do I think that? Why do I think that's a, a more helpful way to read it than, um, than how young earth creationists or the gap theory would, would read it? Well, as I said a couple of weeks ago, the Bible is ancient Near Eastern literature and, uh, and, and people back then aren't going to write about things they know nothing about. So people who are around 2,000 or even 1,000 years ago, but certainly not 4,000, 3,000 years ago, they're not going to be writing about black holes. They're not going to be writing about DNA. They're not going to be writing about Australia they're not going to be writing about vaccines or masks, as uh, Americans keep trying to find in the Bible. Um, then also, though, not going to be talking about dinosaurs because they just didn't know about dinosaurs. And so this, this also means that while the Bible might not be talking about dinosaurs, it doesn't not talk about dinosaurs because the Bible maintains that God made everything, that he sustains everything, which include stars in distant galaxies that where their light took millions of years to reach us. Uh, it talks about, it's talking about trilobites, which are buried beneath the earth, which haven't been discovered yet. It, it's talking about 
everything. God is the creator and the sustainer of all things, things that are seen, things that are unseen. So it doesn't talk explicitly about dinosaurs, but it doesn't not talk about them because they are also created by God and their, their existence in the distant past is testimony to the God who made all things. Now, I should say, maybe I should have said this at the very beginning, I should say that you are very welcome to disagree with me on this. And it's certainly on the, I have a, a growing list of things that I'm, you know, most likely, you know, that I'm very happy to be wrong about. I'm very happy to be proved wrong about. Um, I don't, but I don't think Genesis 1 is doing what some people want it to do. I don't think it's giving us a scientific description of creation. Now, that doesn't mean that God couldn't have created the earth, the universe, just like it says there. But the scientific evidence as we have it just doesn't back up that that's what's going on. Um, now, what is an issue is where Christians judge each other for not believing things, uh, that things happen the same way that they believe. Uh, we see around the world that Christians are dividing among things that they shouldn't be dividing on things in the u.s in particular are dividing among political lines you're either a church that believes in masks and social distancing or you're an anti-mask anti-vaccine church uh, each side of christian christians rather than being united in christ seem to be becoming more and more radicalized uh, even just on the issue of creation uh, ken ham who is probably the most famous um, young earth creationist out there he's an aussie who really made creationism this political issue in the united states he ridicules christians who don't believe in this relatively modern view of creation he says that you don't trust god at his word you either trust god about what he says about jesus and about creation six thousand years ago in six days or you don't trust god at all and on the other on the other on the other side You've got Christians who don't take that view and they look down on creationists as members of a flat earth cult. And I think neither approach is fair. And I might say something a little bit more on this at the end, but there, there is, uh, but, but I think that all those things are important to say. These are not things that should divide us. Uh, we should unite around what we're on about, which is Jesus. We're Christians, we're not creationists creation and i don't know the word that i'm trying to make we don't worship creation we worship the god of creation uh, so let's make sure we focus on that but the next question and you might be a bit annoyed because you just want me to talk about dinosaurs uh and and funnily enough my sons came in with a whole bunch of uh of books they wanted me to show off uh just because they really love dinosaurs so there's obviously this little fella here uh which is quite fun um and and there's some really helpful books if you're ever wanting to know, this is just quite a fun one. Dinosaur Drip, that's one of my great ones. And uh, if you've got little kids, Dirty Great Dinosaur is the best. He, he really like dinosaurs really like spaghetti bolognese, you might be interested to know. Um, and also, did you know that there's an A to Z of, of dinosaurs? Um, X, Y, and Z are all Chinese ones. Uh, Juan, Chuan Han, Osaurus. Yong Chuan Asaurus and Der Zhong Asaurus. But there's lots of uh, different, there's even Quantasaurus. Did you know that? Letter Q has one. So this is an A to Z of dinosaurs. And I think the answer is they probably couldn't play table tennis. But what about actual dinosaurs in the bowl? Now, this is a very silly picture I've got here. Um, you can find different versions of this picture with different things photoshopped in. Uh, there's one where Jesus is holding an AK-47 instead of a dinosaur, or he's holding a King James Bible, uh, or he's holding an American flag or something like that. I think the original drawing had a sheep in his arms, because he's the good shepherd, and probably fewer pterodactyls and volcanoes in the background. But it does raise a question, doesn't it? Again, if we believe the Bible is God's word and the Bible is true on everything that it talks about, uh, and the Bible timeline is accurate to the beginning of the world, then we should be seeing dinosaurs around it, around us. But there aren't. Now, I've explained how young earth creationists explain that. But what is interesting is what we find in Isaiah, in Psalms, in Job. Uh, so Job, which Wesley read to us, Psalms, which Leish read to us before. Um, because there are some creatures in the Bible that are really interesting. 
So there are three, um, I don't know if characters is the right word. Let's stick with characters. There's three characters we meet in the Old Testament. There's the behemoth, the Leviathan, and Tanin. Now, depending on your translation, you may have come across one, two, or three of these, or you may have read a translator's best guess. Uh, the first one there is the plural of, be of beast. So this, the word beast is in the Bible a lot. It was there in Genesis chapter 1, verse 24. Let the land produce living creatures according to their kind, the livestock, that's behemoth, behemoth or behemoth, uh, the creatures that move along the ground, the wild animals, each according to its kind. Um, it's cows or buffalo or sheep or goats. It was also in Psalm 148. Uh, but uh, the one time it is um, often transliterated, which where's it read for us, is uh, is what's sometimes called a plural of majesty. Uh, so the word, I'll give you another example, the word Elohim, which is another word for God, actually means God's plural, but it can have can mean the greatness of God. So it's either God's plural or the great God. So too behemoth means multiple beasts or the great beast. And that's clearly what we're seeing in Job chapter 40, verse 15. So if you want to have a, have a look there uh, at, at Job, it's the chapter, it's the book just before the Psalms, if you're looking for it. Open your Bible and go a bit to the left. Uh, so behemoth is a fascinating creature. Uh, it says that he made the behemoth as one of the creatures I made it along with you. It's, it's vegetarian. It eats grass like an ox. It's super strong. Uh, it's got a big fat tail like a tree. Uh, its bones are like tubes of bronze, limbs like rods of iron. Uh, it, yeah, it's huge. It, but also, verse 21, it can hide. It lies in the lotus plants. It hides in the reeds. Uh, and, and trees are much bigger than it and that sort of thing. But it's not scared by rivers because it's much bigger than rivers. But 24, it's untrappable. You can't trap it. You can't capture it. You can't pierce its nose uh, like you might with, with any other normal animal. So what, what is it? What is this animal? Well, if you're a young earth creationist, you've got one very easy answer. It's a, it's a dinosaur. Uh, I was trying to, trying to guess what dinosaur it might be. Um, oh, here's another book they've given me. Uh, it could be, um, I don't know, maybe like a, a, a brontosaurus or something like that. Uh, one of those, you know, one of those um, ones that eats leaves and plants oh maybe it's like this one the um what are these called duckbill dinosaurs that can't be their real name anyway the ones who live by the river and they hoot a lot according to this book um and so uh, uh it's it's uh, some translators though they're like oh let's have a guess let's call it something that's not a dinosaur so i guess it's a hippo or a water buffalo um, now, they don't have tails like bronze, but they can at least hide in the water, which I guess would not be easy for some of those larger dinosaurs. Anyway, this is the first big dinosaur, or first, sorry, the first big creature we meet in the dinosaur, in, in the Bible, which is often called a dinosaur. Uh, the second one we've got there in that list is a leviathan, which is a lot more common, the behemoth. We meet it all in the next chapter of Job, Job 41. So he's sort of contrasting uh, Job's been trying to say, um, you know, God, help me out here. Why don't you, you uh, reveal yourself and, and, and that sort of thing. And, and God responds to Job by saying how big he is compared to Job. And so he describes the Leviathan um, and he describes him. It, it actually goes the whole of chapter 41, but really big, really unstoppable. No one can catch it. No, no one could hope to subdue it. Uh, and it goes on, say, verse... Uh, Verse 14 talks about its teeth. Verse 13, it's got this armor. Verse 15, rows of shields. Uh, so it sounds a bit like a stegosaurus or something like that. Um, but then verse 18, it's, it's breathing fire, which is quite interesting. It sounds like laser beam eyes or something like that. Uh, it's quite a, a fascinating creature being described here. Um, and so, so what, what, is, what is this creature? Uh, maybe it sounds a bit like, uh, well, again, if you're a young earth creationist, this is clearly a stegosaurus or something like that. Plates of, of, um, of, of uh, rows of shields, verse 15, something like that. Uh, other boring people say it's a crocodile. Uh, the word um, Leviathan in modern Hebrew, Leviathan, just means whale. So maybe it's something like that. 
Uh, if you go elsewhere, so Psalm 74 talks about it. It says it has multiple heads. So that rules out, you know, some of the other creatures. I was thinking, you know, in Jurassic World, that huge, like, giant shark thing that leaps up and, and yeah, really super scary. Uh, but maybe it's, maybe it's a dragon or, or, or something like that. If you read the um, creation research literature, it describes um, how a creature could breathe fire. So it thinks about if you combine the methane of a cow and the spark of an electric eel and maybe like a dangling appendage of an angler fish so that when it sparks, it doesn't explode itself, uh, you could have very plausibly have a fire breathing dinosaur. Obviously we haven't found the fossils of it yet, but who knows? So that's the Leviathan, quite exciting, quite fun. Uh, Leviathan, and then we've got Tanin. Uh, we actually met it back in Genesis 1. That was translated as the great creatures of the sea. We also met it in Psalm 148. Um, and it, it could be, in, in Exodus, it's a snake. So when Moses had his staff, it turned into a snake. That's the Tanin word, maybe like a little dragony thing. But usually it's referring to something deep down below in the, in the bowels of the earth. So it can come up either through big holes or through the water because they're both ways to the, the, un, you know, the, the underworld. The suggestion is, again, from Young Earth Creationists, that that's what the Loch Ness Monster is. Or, or maybe that's evidence of uh, sailors talk about the Kraken, this infamous sea creature which might swallow ships whole, that sort of thing. Uh, but really, you can see from, if you want to chase those references down, the Tanin is a very flexible description. It could be whichever sea monster you might imagine if you're near the water and scared of what might be down below. Uh, now, however, rather than, I guess, projecting us into that past before humans could have known anything, I think what we're, what's going on in, in, in the Old Testament in particular with these creatures of uh, behemoth, Le leviathan, and tanin is we're being pointed towards an even deeper past where the barrier between the, the physical and the spiritual or the natural and the spiritual, that, that barrier is sort of dissolved. If you remember when last year we did Revelation and it's sort of like God's view of history where there's powers and, and, and um, spirits and, and angels and demons and, and they're sort of interacting in the, in the physical world uh, this is that sort of view of the world where um, the powers of the underworld are, are manifested and they're real powers that come out of the, the grave below and can reach into the world and drag people back down. If you think about, say, Daniel chapter 7, there's these creatures who are churned out of the sea, these hybrid creatures who come to devour and to destroy. Uh, it doesn't call them... Uh, any any name that we've used so far, but they could be another way of describing Leviathan or Tanin or, or maybe some mixture of them. Again, Job talks, in Job, God talks very clearly about being in control of these creatures. For him, they're just pets. Uh, they're, they're just pets that he can drag around or, or have on a leash or, or, or put a hook in their nose, that sort of thing. They're just pets to God. But in Daniel, there's this change where now they're breaking their boundaries. There's these set bounds. There's, there's, uh, there's the world that God's created. And then there's the underworld below. And there's this, this border. You're not allowed to encroach. But they're coming from the deserted places, from the depths of the sea, from the bowels of the earth. And they're encroaching into our realm, which is God's jurisdiction. And this is a problem because they're not supposed to be here. And they're, they're wreaking havoc. And so that's why in, Job's, uh, in, in Daniel 7, it's a perfect moment for God to step in. He intervenes. And in Daniel, he intervenes through this one, like a son of man. He resumes his authority, which he, these usurping creatures had tried to steal. And so you can maybe imagine if we fast forward to the final book of the New Testament, there's that similar imagery coming through. We meet more beasts, more dragons, more serpents. Uh, so maybe I'll, I'll just read you a couple of verses uh, Revelation 12 is maybe the, um, the most exciting one. Uh, so Romans, uh, Re sorry, Revelation 12, uh, then verse 3, then an, another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its head. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. 
The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour the, her child the moment he was born. Uh, verse 7, then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon he was, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough. They lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. The ancient snake called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to earth and his angels with him. Uh, and just one last bit, verse 13. When the dragon saw that he'd been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who'd given birth to the male child. The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness where she would be taken care of for a time, times and half time out of the snake's reach. From, then from his mouth, a snake spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Then the dragon was enraged at the one went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. He's been, this one uh, has been thrown down from heaven. He continues down. Afterwards, he gets thrown down to the abyss where his friends are, and they're going to come up from the underworld, and they're going to cause havoc and destroy God's anointed. Now, I don't think anyone is saying that Revelation 12 is describing dinosaurs. But you can see that in this same trajectory of these fantastic beasts of the Bible, in this same sort of worldview which sees these uh, creatures as evil and chaos personified. You know, from these creatures of the deep in the first book of the Bible in Genesis, they're, then they're creatures, they're, they're, they are creatures that are part of God's good and ordered and pleasing creation. Uh, they're creatures that God jokes about with Job. They're terrifying for men, but they're just a, a, a little plaything for him. But then in Daniel and Revelation, they become terrifying and horrendous. They're symbols of rebellion against God as sovereign and against Jesus as king. But the moral of the story in, in, in Daniel and Revelation is that while they might seem unstoppable now, however these forces manifest themselves, whether it be in, in kingdoms or powers or politicians or emperors or kings, they seem unstoppable now, but they will not endure forever. You know, just as big and as terrifying as they are today, they will fall even further than they, they've risen. They'll be destroyed as God restores order and justice and true goodness once and for all. And so somehow I've, uh, I've started this talk about dinosaurs to discussing the final chapter of the Bible. But as I said two weeks ago, when we read the Bible as one part of as many parts of the one story, we see how it fits together with Jesus at the center as the one who is the one like the son of man who comes to restore and destroy. And so it's important as we think about questions like this, that we understand the Bible in general and Genesis one in particular, not with reference to whatever scientific model is in vogue or is politically motivating today, but we understand it, first of all, with reference to the God of the universe, because God has made this world the place where he has chosen to shower his blessings on his good creation. And even despite the intrusion of sin and the rebellion of creation, he's working to restore and to redeem and to renew through his son, the Lord Jesus. And so again, as Christians, we are, we are able to disagree about some of these final details, finer details, but what we can't do is we can't let these details come between us. We need to focus on the main thing. Now, I should confess that I come to this from the position of someone who used to be totally into this. I, uh, I've been to creation conferences. I've read the books and the magazines. I've, uh, I've got a copy of this book, which I've read through many times, and I used to annoy family members to the point where they didn't want to talk about it anymore. Uh, what I'd done as I talked about dinosaurs and how old the earth was, is I'd made a, a peripheral thing, something we can all disagree on and have different views on. I'd made it the main thing. Now, in the same way as so you probably wouldn't attack a brother or sister in Christ because they have a different view of baptism or whether Christians can eat meat or whether they can get tattoos. You know, we shouldn't attack or divide over this topic. So maybe to finish off, um, as I was grappling with all this uh, 15 years ago, I, a friend shared this diagram with me. It's just that shallow X. 
Uh, this is the Bible, essentially. At the beginning of, of the Bible, you've got the creation. At the end, you've got the new creation. And as, as the lines are further apart, things are less in focus. Uh, we, and we, there's more disagreement about those things. There's more metaphorical language about both of those ends of the Bible. Uh, you know, just look at the different creation stories, Genesis 1, Genesis 2, uh, Psalm 75, Psalm 148. They're different ideas of how creation happened. Uh, and then at the other end, obviously, there's, there's obviously many different views of what's going on there. Uh, but my point is we can disagree about the beginnings and the ends if we're agreed on the vibe, the bigger picture, that God made everything and that God will remake everything, that God is in control. Uh, but trying to be, extract specific details about, about the beginning and the end is something we can't really do. The specifics are fuzzy because the focus isn't there. But right at the centre, where the X comes together, is where things slow down. That's the moment where the Bible slows down. It goes through an exquisite detail, the life, the death, the resurrection, the mission of Jesus. This is where our life is as Christians, tied up with him. And so that's where our focus should be, sharing him. So be excited about the beginning and the end uh, because of what they tell us about God, about who he is but don't let them distract you from the centre. Uh, and, of course, go, go off and study dinosaurs. That would be great fun, I'm sure. Who wouldn't love to be a paleontologist? Uh, but rather than um, looking, but, but enjoy looking for them in the world of God's creation rather than looking for dinosaurs in the book of God's revelation. Uh, the book of God's revelation is all about Jesus. Uh, and so let's be Jesus people above all things. Let me pray and then we'll sing. Our gracious Father, we thank and praise you for the fascinating and infinitely beautiful creation which you've made and in which you've created us. We stand in awe at the minute as well as the unfathomably large, all of which testify to your power and goodness. We also thank you for your word in which you reveal to us your character and your purposes. We thank you that we can know you through Jesus and know life in him. And we pray that as we continue to grapple with these questions of the beginning and the end, that we do so with humility and with perspective, and that we might love others as you have loved us. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so to respond, we're going to sing a song that, like Doug's sermon, it starts with creation, and it finishes with new life and the new creation. Um, let's sing together.
fall as the voice of God is heard. See the flame burst forth, new life is born and his people cry. Glory and the lame will dance, the blind will see and the dead will rise again. For the word of God has walked with us and he makes us cry. through for Doug, but I think he's got a few books that he'd like to recommend us to read. Yeah, true. Um, so this is a book that's about to come out, which I really want to watch. I really want to read, but uh, I, I couldn't get it because it doesn't get released for a couple more days, um, a couple more weeks. So this looks really interesting. It's a science communicator who's, uh, who's quite in interested in um, talking about how um, science actually helps us learn about God rather than having a battle. So that's uh, that looks like a good book to get a hold of. Um, this is another one which I uh, I heard a really interesting interview about. Um, so this is again that uh, apologist William Lane Craig. Uh, he sort of um, he accepts the science, but also uh, wants to think about if there was a historical Adam, when would this guy? When would he have turned up? Um, which is sort of related to all these questions. Uh, and, and he ends up saying that the Adam, if there was an Adam, he would have been the common ancestor of Homo sapiens and Neanderthals, which is Homo heidelbergensis or something like that. Um, so because we can see that both Neanderthals and Homo sapiens have uh, imagination and creativity and abstract thought. So that, that was quite an interesting um, sort of thought process, thinking about that. Uh, and then there's also this uh, podcast, if you're a podcast person, which uh, often has discussions about this sort of thing. It might have, um, uh, there's some, for example, Ken Ham's on there a few times um, with my Craig uh, and other people, uh, Luke, um, Luke Barnes, the, the cosmologist, and they're talking about things like fine tuning and, and um, the colour um, arguments, stuff like that, things that people who are really into this stuff talk about a lot. So you might be interested in checking some of those things out. Cool. Uh, there are not too many questions this week, um, mm. but uh, I'll just read I, out some of them. I can, add, I can, yeah, I can do the, uh, the, um, the dinosaur, why, why dinosaurs question, I guess. Sure. Can I read that one out? Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, so uh, God was there at the beginning, uh, will be there at the end. Uh, so does that mean that God made the dinosaurs and knew where they were going to be extinct? If so, what was the point of creating dinosaurs? Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting question, isn't it? So why did God make lots of things that we will never see? Um, things like why did he make? distant galaxies and um you know creatures that live for a day and are gone um i mean didn't, then they all turn into oil maybe it's <laughs> to give us a nice oil supply so we can drive our cars uh make plastic uh i mean i think that the reality is that the, the cre creativity one of the things that we do learn in Genesis 1 is just how creative and, um, uh, you know, God made the world so that it would be fruitful. So that Genesis says that he made things to produce after their own kind. And, and it just, it, it's not like every single thing God says, okay, you exist and you exist. Oh, yeah, okay, make you exist. 
Now, that's not how we're supposed to think of creation. It's this uh, God made this, um, like a, a, you know, well, it's described as a garden, like it's fruitful and it's, it's luscious and there's just so much and things are, are coming to life and, and then rotting and, and new things are happening. Like it's just this overly productive and beautiful and, and exciting uh, world which means that there are lots of things that happen and, and we don't see, um, but that's okay. Uh, that's, that's part of saying that maybe creation isn't all about us. Maybe creation is all about God. And, you know, when you, when we have started digging up dinosaur bones in the last, you know, 150, 200 years or whatever it is that uh, we started discovering and working out these and name, you know, making up the name dinosaur, uh, that's maybe when we started discovering we, we, we discovering more and more of uh, God's glory. And, and, you know, you talk to any scientist who's trying to find out new things and, and then, so uh, Francis Bacon, the guy who invented modern science. So the idea that you're not allowed to say God did it. Uh, so the way that you do science, you say, how did this, what are the processes behind this? Let's assume that God made everything. How did this thing happen? And, uh, and people talk about studying God's book of creation. That's sort of why I used that term earlier. Uh, these, these things all reveal more to us of the God who uh, made this world that is so intricate. Uh, and whether you zoom right into DNA and, and to subatomic particles or whatever it is, or when you zoom out and you look at distant galaxies, all of them reveal to us the, the wonders of this God. Uh, who would then love us and want to know us and want to make himself known to us, um, which is, yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful and a, and a humbling thing, I think. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for that. Which isn't a great answer. <laughs> We'd like to know more, but uh, that's okay. It's helpful to help us to keep thinking about it. And I think, like you say, keep the focus on the one that we are sure of, which is the death and why Jesus came in, and that's the one big thing and should not uh, distract us from the main focus. Yeah, that's right. And so in answer to the question, what's this got to do with me? Uh, I think, yeah, that the question, yeah, in a sense, it has nothing to do with you, except to say that the Bible reveals God to us. Um, so when we're trying to do all this work of trying to make the Bible fit science and fit history, we're actually doing something with it that it's not supposed to do what the bible is supposed to do when, when we spend all our focus on dinosaurs we in the bible trying to find them there and, and, and work out how it can all fit we we lose our focus and so when i've talked to people who are super excited about six thousand year creation you know they say I, I was staying with a family and they said oh i met this woman uh and she was really interested in christianity and so I gave her this magazine and it was a creation research magazine and my heart just sunk. I, 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 oh, I didn't say anything because I was a guest in their house. I was staying with them, but I just thought, why would you, if someone wants to know about Jesus, why would you say, Hey, let's, let's get you into this um, quite fringe and quite peripheral view on creation. Why not tell them about who Jesus is and what he's done for you and, and what it means to know him in in the three God's words. So, in a sense, yeah, dinosaurs in the Bible don't have anything to do with you. Bibles in the dinosaur. Uh, sorry, the Bible is rather about revealing God to us. Uh, so Psalm 19 talks about the wonders of God's creation, how all creation sings to Him. But then it, it transitions. It says, "But in the law of the Lord, we actually get to know Him," mm -hmm. and it's getting to know God. And how does God reveal Himself to us? through Jesus and that's what we should be focusing on and excited most excited about yeah. cool. cool thank you thank you Thanks, Thanks for that. Cool. Uh, now we're going into announcements uh, open up your e-bulletin and we'll scroll down to the section entitled announcements today as you know it's the fourth week of this new series entitled a new a rational faith uh, please continue to use the Slido link. You can uh, keep asking your questions and I put it up right through to tomorrow. If you have like anything covered in the coming weeks, I uh, would like to answer your questions next week. All other ministries remain online. Uh, continue to contact the relevant people in the e if you'd like to know more information. Baptism. Uh, every year we hold a service to baptize people. 
it is really cool to be able to um, publicly proclaim that Jesus is Lord and King. Uh, if you'd like to discuss more uh, about baptism, please speak to Doug today, as today is the deadline. Classes will begin next week on Sunday, the 5th of September. EGM is on the 12th of September at 2 p.m. to appoint a new children pastor and to elect two reps for uh, 2022 uh, Deacons Nominating Committee. Members should have received an email. Uh, please check your uh, mailbox. And if you haven't received it, uh, make sure you contact Peter Lau. Details are in the e-bulletin. Finally, we're preparing a combined Thanksgiving service and it will also be our belated senior minister inauguration for Reverend David Trump. Mark down 21st of November at 10 a.m. for this service for now. More details to come subject to the latest New South Wales COVID restrictions. Cool. Uh, if you have any question from today, anything that really did not make sense, um, or even not knowing what, how today's message can relate to us, uh, please let us know. And we'd like to address any questions that you might have. If you don't normally join us, can I invite you to join us again next week, same time at 11.30. Please join with me in prayer as we close off today's service. Dear me, Father, thank you that our salvation does not depend on what we can do, but what you have already done for us on the cross. Thank you for Jesus who died and rose in victory. Thank you that in his death and his resurrection, we are made right with you. Thank you for the message of the gospel that brings life. We pray that we will humble ourselves under God's mighty hand and that he may lift us up in due time. Let us cast all our anxiety on him because he cares for us. Let us be alert and of sober mind. The enemy of the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. We pray that we will resist him, standing firm in the faith, because we know the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. May the God of grace, who called us to his eternal glory in Christ, after we have suffered a little while, will himself restore us and make us strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. This concludes the formal part of today's service. So thank you for joining us and we'll see you next week, same time at 11.30 as we tackle the next topic of a rational faith on what about the Aztecs? Till then, we'll see you next week. Thanks.